And this, what I'm going to read today is from the Beck translation. So if you want to follow along with that, you can look on the uh, front of your bulletin. 2 Timothy 1.5. I recall how sincere your faith was, just as it lived in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, before you, so I am convinced it is in you too. May the Lord add his blessings to this reading. Due to the interesting construction of English, uh, if you read this in uh, King James or New King James, you'll find that it's in the middle of a sentence. And I found a translation that lets this verse stand uh, by itself uh, in a punctuation sort of style. And I also like the way it summarizes the thought quickly. Now, I was going to come up and tell all of you that I was going to take off my coat in accordance with scriptural mandates, it says that the leader of the worship service is not supposed to wear clothes that make him sweat. That's right in the Bible. So anybody who has false prudishness and reverence, uh, but it seems to be cooling down a little bit. And I must say that it's a little cooler probably here than it is up there. But uh, it's very important. The Lord, the Lord saw that it was important enough to talk about it. So I guess I will try it this way for a little bit. And I know that you're going to all try to sleep now, too, because it's so warm out there. Anyway, I'm just so enthused about my topic, I hardly know what to say. I remember doing a family life uh, seminar in the Ohio uh, conference. That, one's, that sticks out for some reason in my mind. And it was also in the Ohio conference that I had a chance to meet two precious young men who had given their lives anew to Jesus in their 20s. And they were just so earnest to know how they could follow in the footsteps of the master. And since that time, I can tell you with great thankfulness that both of these brothers are now prominent ministers in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I am just so grateful that God could give me a little part in leading some young person, persons, to acknowledge the claims of God and build up the kingdom. One of them, even as you're seated here, has just been called to the general conference to share the insights he has on outreach ministries. And in fact, I'm so enthused about it that I'm going to share it with you today as part of this sermon. You see, this is not a time for us to be just seated waiting, quote, for the Lord to come. It is a time for us to research anew the meaning of the word occupy until Jesus comes. So, I want you to begin by looking at the Bible text. Who is the I? Let's see how many of us can give us a context. Who is the I at the front of your uh, bulletin? Who, who does that refer to? Paul, thank you. I recall how sincere your faith who is the antecedent of your? Timothy. So we have this. Paul recalls how sincere Timothy's faith was, and he is, of course. And then he starts talking family. He starts, he starts a beautiful biographical sketch in just a few short words in which he says, your grandma... Timothy, was faithful 
in sharing the message with your mommy, Eunice. And because of that, I am convinced, Paul says, that you, Timothy, the grandbaby, I believe you share the same faith. Isn't that something? We talk, you know, when I, we talk about the history of families. Remember in psychology, you know, you, you learn about famous families, not always good families, but famous families who are bent on evil, and psychologists study them to try to ascertain what they can learn from a, a constellation of family members who all seem to head the same way into nothing but crime and corruption. And it makes, quite, uh, it makes for quite a study. But it can also go the other way. A family can be the bastion and ark and launching pad for the new generation to go forth conquering and to conquer for Jesus Christ and to uplift humanity here and now. And that is the challenge that we have. So first of all, I'm going to make all of you feel uncomfortable by saying unequivocally, that you're all involved. I know some of you are thinking, oh, pastor, I'm sleeping this one out because I don't have children. And maybe it's just my wife and I, or maybe it's just me. So none of this applies. Well, that's a wrong answer because the Bible says, if you are a child of God, then you have the privilege of representing the family of God in your family network. You say, well, I was adopted. I don't even know who my family is, and I'm not connected with any of the people that I grew up with. No. God has given you not only responsibilities to the family that you know about. Now, follow me. But he's given you responsibilities to the family that surrounds you every day. And they may not be within the corridors of your own home. They may be out of ways. But you have nieces and nephews. You have cousins. You have acquaintances that you have the privilege of leading to a closer walk with Jesus. So there's nobody that's excused. And then the second thing I want to say about this, because I'm going to talk about some things that um, you may not have heard at least for a long time. But I want you to know that we're all, all in the same leaky boat. That is, we have all sinned to come short of the glory of God. There is no idyllic, pristine, perfect family as we like to imagine it. There are families that are striving for that lofty goal and who are mightily blessed of God in as far as they respond to his leading. But there's no family without a challenge, without a problem, without something to work out. But thank God, in his great mercy, he has shown us how to work problems out. And so you don't, you know, and I'm going to belabor this, you're going to sit here, and if I start sharing with you the ideals, you're, some of you are going to say right away, I bet he's just really getting after me because I haven't always lived that ideal. No. I'm simply sharing with every one of you that it is possible for us to begin anew and that we don't hold our past against each other but that we view each other as we want Jesus to view us. Candidates for the kingdom, washed by the blood of the Lamb, cleansed and ennobled and empowered to live the Christian life. And so it's in that context that everything that I'm going to share with you today is given. So I want you to remember that very, very closely. Now, in order to begin by starting everyone out, together, I am going to ask for a volunteer. This is interactive, because I can sense people will start going to sleep in this weather, uh, unless they're worried that I might out call on them. So I'm going to start with a volunteer, and I'm going to ask somebody who will read in a loud stentorian voice, right up there, the sermon 
thought because it essentially says what I want to say today. Who would like to do that? Okay, Billy, come on up. Oh, we have, we have, a, uh, we have something here. Come on right to here. Uh, Roland's going to give you a little piece of equipment that will enable this to be more effective. <laughs> Thank you, Rollin. All right. Would you like, excuse me, would you think it appropriate for a missionary in a foreign land to berate and chastise the natives because they weren't living Christian lives? Silly, you say. Yet how many regard family as their first and foremost mission field? Ah, but that's what the Elijah last day's message says. And if this is true, then our kindest words, our noblest deeds, and our loftiest love should be expressed in the family. As a natural result, our outreach, outreach ministries will blossom too. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Thank you. Thank you. We may need that later too, Rollins. So, do you want our outreach ministries to blossom? They begin in the family. Or as Ministry of Healing says, regard yourself as a missionary first and foremost to those closest to you. And thus we have a spirit of deference and kindness. How many couples find themselves in false arguments that only alienate? Well, Harry, it was only eight miles to the post office. No, Millie, it was nine. I'm sure it was A. No, it was not. And we get into this stuff. You know, even if somebody's telling a story, your, your mate, your spouse, your child, and they miss a little point or two, don't always be in such a rush to correct them. Let them share the theme of the story. And you can talk with them later if you feel so burdened, uh, you know, to get their chronology and their geography straight. But there's so many things that we do not need to belabor and to go on and on about. Now, this is all in the setting of giving the last day's message. That's what families are for. They're to be training grounds for Jesus. They're to be places where the younger members learn how to witness. Amen. And I can remember when my sister's kids were young, she would take them out a lot call portering. And she just, you know, that worked. She was able to expand uh, until she had, I believe, the largest uh, youth literature uh, ministry in the country. She would go to five academies every week. And a rich doctor paid for her to be chauffeured from north, clear up at, um, at the academy there in Auburn, down to Columbia Academy, to Portland Adventist Academy, to Laurelwood Academy, and finally, and if you know where I'm headed, what's the other academy in the South? Milo. And that's way down, way down in Oregon. And she would cover those every week. And I'll tell you something. The Lord wants us to have our families as missionary centers. May not be in a dramatic way, it may be just seemingly small, but they need to be a missionary center. And while I'm talking of this, I'll just tell you a couple of references uh, that helped our family immensely. Uh, these are some of the greatest family help manuals you'll ever find, and a lot of people aren't reading them today because they heard somebody use them as a club. Oh, it hurts. And they heard, and so they said, I'm not going to have anything to do with this. But I want you to know when you read all of what's in Adventist Home and Child Guidance, you will be prepared to lead your home in the paths of righteousness and all the inhabitants therein. And one of the things that this brings out that I want to mention, it's not usually a problem, but it is in some cases. And I'm going to read something very startling. Very startling. Mm. Very startling. You know, people are going to be impressed by how children are used by God in the last days. 
We're told by inspiration that children are going to be used to share the message because we can't. But how can they be used of God to share the message if we're not teaching it to them day by day? If we're, and we need to know it for ourselves. Well, I'm not sure how much I uh, ought to say here, but let me give you one statement. In an effort to excuse themselves, some say, quote, my home duties, my children claim my time and my means. So here are people who actually say, oh, yes, I'm spending lots of time with the family, so I can't do this church work because I'm with family. Well, there's a point where that gets a little bit like an ingrown toenail. You, you become so ingrown that your family ceases to look out. And then she says, parents, your children should be your helping hand, increasing your power and ability to work for the master." So we see that our, that our families should be centers of help for the church. Centers of help. What an interesting thought. What an interesting thought. Let me share something with you that uh, you may not have uh, thought about in this way before. 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 24, as we consider our families as altars for Jesus. Now, I'm assuming that most of you have read, uh, you know, enough of Old Testament history that you know how important altars were, right? Even Jacob, you know, he felt that he had a special altar after he saw sleeping on a stone. By the way, have any of you ever tried to use a stone for a pillow? Have you ever tried to use something else hard for a pillow? I have. And it's not very comfortable. But, but, but Jacob felt that he was right in the presence of God because he had such a wonderful dream or vision when he was there. And so at any great event, the people would build an altar. You know, a little stone uh, edifice, I'd almost say, but it's just a little stone square thing or however shape, and that represented they're seeking after God and celebrated God's working in their lives. You say, well, Pastor Grams, sure glad we don't have to worry about that now. And I don't have to kill lambs on an altar and none of that. This altar thing is out the window. Oh, no. Every one of you have an altar. You have a potential for an altar. It's within the confines of your home. Even if it's only you, one person. Your home can be an altar where God is glorified, where Jesus' name is mentioned reverently and with appreciation. And your home is a place where your children learn and those who are about you learn to love Jesus more. And if you don't have children, then the people who come to visit you, they can know that this house it's for Jesus. It's dedicated to him. And I think I've mentioned this before, but I had a Pentecostal, I think he was a preacher friend in Detroit when we lived there. And I forget what I had him come over to the house for, something. And he walked in the house and just like that, he says, I know that God is here. And I never thought of it quite that way. But I just know that you, each one of you, can be a bastion for the kingdom, an outreach vehicle for the enlargement of the vineyard of God. Isn't that a wonderful privilege? I mean, it's just incomparable. So in 2 Samuel 24, 18, 2 Samuel 24, 18, we get this incredible imperative. By the way, it's also, I think it's 1 Chronicles 21, 18 and onward. And it says in Gad, now who was Gad? He was a, a prophet. How many of you studied in the last five years the book of Gad? I didn't trick anybody, did I? But the Bible says very clearly that he was a prophet. But he didn't write a book. But he was a prophet. But he didn't write a 
Am I stuck or what? I say that for those who would say that you can't be a prophet if you didn't write a book. Just something to think about. Well, anyway, and Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. What was he told to do? Go up and erect a what? Listen, every one of you had the privilege of erecting an altar every day. Your home is the altar. And that's where children learn about Jesus, at the altar in your home. Now, I'm going to be really invasive, but before I do, I think I'd better read one more text to uh, give me courage to share what I'm about to share. Matthew, the 19th chapter, Matthew 19, Matthew 19, 13, as we think of our homes as altars for God, Matthew 19, 13, then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked them. So here we have it. Children are too noisy for church. Children are in the way. They haven't perfectly learned reverence yet, so we don't want them around. And Jesus said, I think sometimes we think the children in those days, they were painted all pristine. You know, they just grew up, you know, hi, mommy and daddy. Yes, whatever. You know, children were children. And they were naturally boisterous. And the disciples thought they were keeping law and order, or as we would say in church, reverence. Now, of course, there's something special to teach children, and we do that. But it is a process, and it doesn't happen in one day. And so anyway, they brought it, these children to Jesus and uh, that he might put his hands on them. Wait a minute. Who brought the children to Jesus? The mommies. In fact, we're told by inspiration that it was one mommy's idea, and then she decided to what? Invite her friends. And a whole bunch of mommies came. And if you have a whole bunch of mommies with lots of noisy kids, whoo, and disciples in their appropriateness, they must have gone into true apoplexy. But they thought they'd help Jesus out, and so they rebuked them. Get these noisy kids out of here. We have got to maintain reverence here. But Jesus said what? Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And then he what? Laid his hands on them and departed. What do you think the mommies felt when they left? Jesus just blessed little Henry and little Mary and little Elizabeth and little whomever, John and Frank. Jesus blessed them. That's so great. Do we have that attitude? You notice that many times I've tried to involve children in the church service, and we need to do that more and more so that children feel that this is their church. This is a place to prepare to give the final message. Now, I want to share something right now that... uh, that I'm not going to ask you to respond to. How many of you take the effort, make the effort to have family worship? You realize that at the family worship time, God draws specially near as the children or whomever is living there, or even yourself if you're by yourself as God sees that you honor him and that you are training others to know more about the kingdom of God. 
And don't hide behind the American thing. Well, I'm not professional at this, so I'll leave that to the pastor and Bible teachers. Listen, if you can read the Bible, you can get a simple translation, have other people in your house read just a verse or two and talk about it and share it and just sing a short song. Yes, too many family worships have been too long, but no, we miss a great blessing when we don't conduct family worship. We don't want to be extreme like the family that even if they got home late from some outing, they'd make the kids all wake up, the little kids, and have worship. No, you don't do things like that. But you seek to make it a regular part of the family schedule. You say, oh, you don't know me, pastor. You don't know my family. Somebody leaves here, somebody leaves there. Nobody's together. Listen, get as many as you can when you can and write out a verse for the missing member to read when they get up after having worked all night or whatever and do whatever you can to involve everyone in creative and new and innovative ways. And you can be blessed. Mightily blessed. Well, I'm going to give you something. But before I give it to you, because this is powerful, it will burn your fingernails. So I'm not going to give this out just, you know, in a cavalier mash fashion. And our copy machine broke down. So we only have 44, which means that I would like the heads of every family to be sure to have these and we'll give the rest out as we can until we've gotten rid of them all. This um, little handout has to do with praying for our children. And it is very, very powerful. And I believe I got this book in Honduras um, in 1982 from the uh, lady who put it together herself, Verlene Youngberg. And uh, I, I think you'll find it very, very helpful. But before we do that, I feel that we need to involve some young people. So I have some illustrious person of our young people is going to come up and just share a little. So come on up, Jordan. It's, I got it right, right? Yes, I always get Jordan and Josh mixed up. But Jordan's going to share a little something right now, and then we're going to uh, continue. He's a, he'll, he'll do it up there, but I, I won't need... For this one, but I may need it in a little bit, Rollin, because we're not done. <laughs> okay, Jordan. I just picked a small verse that I found whenever I was reading the Bible that I wanted to share. It's Revelation 21, verse 4. It said, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And I really liked it because he called it former things, and that there will be no more of them. Yeah. Yes. What a privilege. Yes, it is for us to ponder these things and to have our young people sharing. Now, we're going to have more young people sharing a little bit here and there as time goes on, but uh, I want you to, to uh, keep that in mind as, as we move forward. Now, <clears throat> before I give out the, uh, this little thing that I have for you, you're, you might wonder, well, how can I teach my young people to be active for Jesus or tell somebody else how they could teach their children to be active for Jesus? Well, our church is just embarking on BibleStudyOffer.com. And we don't have the rest of the materials yet, right, Wanda? They haven't come in. They seem to be backlogged. But we are going to introduce you to this program. You say, oh, no, Pastor, I'm not going out giving Bible studies. That's all right. There are other things you can do to be part of BibleStudy.com. It's an amazing way to get people involved in Bible study. And so I'm going to ask the children to come up, and we want to get these out, and there's enough of these for everybody. So please do not share. Uh, give them. Come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get these out for each person very quickly, and then I can talk about it. Oh, yes. Okay. Anybody else? And we'll just get out as many as we can. You want to take some? There you go. 
Okay, you can hand them out, Parson. Yes, all right. Now, yes, thank you. Let's have everybody have one of these. Some more over here. Houston doesn't have one. Kids, look all around for hands that are uh, coming up. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes. All right. Does everybody have one? You need another one? There you go. All right. Thank you. All right. Now, I want to just go through it very briefly, and then I'm going to leave you with something else so that I can uh, head out on a train before I get pummeled, because what I'm going to give you is powerful material. But um, I want you to open this up. Did everybody get one? Sure, you can have one more. You, that's absolutely right, Parson. All right. Now, I want you to open it up. On the left, it says, in a world full of what? Lies and hypocrisy. Now, go to the next page. It says, landmarks of prophecy, or it is written. We're choosing to go with landmarks of prophecy because they have more resources for that. Is that right, Wanda? I think it is. I'm pretty sure. I talked with him, and I know that a lot of the materials they have are from the landmarks of prophecy. And he also told me that we get some free material or something. I can't remember. They have a lot more material on landmarks of prophecy. So what would they get? DVD presentations and so on. What do you do? Well, turn over the page, and you're encouraging people. Go to the back page. Thank you so much. It says request online. All they have to do is go to BibleStudyOffer.com and they request in one of three ways. They can have somebody personally study. Uh, well, they can do their own personal study, I should say. They can study with somebody or they can go to a group and study. And in fact, when it says personal study, that means that that. They don't have to worry about anybody coming from the church except to give them their new lessons each week. So if I got that right? Wanda's our resident expert, so she is getting in on the ground floor of this, and, and Sherry will be uh, working with her on that. So you enter your contact information and the five-digit code. Now, how many of you see where it says offer code? It's blank because we don't have ours printed yet. Oh, we can mark them in. We know our number, don't we? AL004. Okay, we're going to have a whole bunch of them marked, so they'll be coming as soon as AL004. And then, guess what? Any request automatically is, is uh, channeled our way. It's a wonderful program. You don't have to per se give a Bible study. You can help facilitate giving Bible studies. And so along with that, we have little cards that you can share with people as well. And what we probably will do when we get the materials is that we will, we will probably do a mailing and mail a whole bunch of them out in this area. And then the young people are coming from Washington Hills College, and they can just accent what we're already doing. Isn't this a wonderful opportunity that you can train those around you to work for Jesus in such a simple way? Now, in keeping with that, I'm giving this as a fellow traveler. But essentially... Let me just give you, these are mostly quotations. Satan is constantly at work, but few have any idea of his activity and subtlety. The people of God must be prepared to withstand the wily foe. It is this resistance that Satan dreads. He knows better than we do the limit of his power. And so I want you to pray about that. And then on the other side, it says this. It quotes Isaiah 49, 24, 25, which I hope all of you will learn to pray for others. Listen to this, quote, Children who have not experienced the cleansing power of Jesus are the lawful prey of the enemy. And the evil angels have easy access to them. By the faithful 
and untiring efforts of the parents and the blessing and grace bestowed upon the children in response to the prayers of the parents. The power of the evil angels may be broken and a sanctifying influence shed upon the children. We need to learn how to pray for our children and for others and for acquaintances with a prayer that will not be denied. And it's this earnestness that I have two pages of powerful quotes for you. And so I'm going to ask the young people to come up again. And this time, I'm, I'm, we're, I've only have 44, so it's mostly the heads of families on this one. And... Uh, yeah, and let me, I, here we go, I'm sorry. And then if we still have some, I think everybody's going to be too modest, I'm almost sure, and we're going to have 39 of our 44 left, but um, I, I think what we'll do is we'll, we're just, if, if we still have more, then we're just going to keep handing them out more. Thank you. Oops, I want you to have that. Let's just keep walking around. And somebody who thought they could share, they need to, yes. All right, let's just keep them going until they're gone. So in the back there, Warren has some. The twins have some. Let's have some more hands. Let's don't be false modest here about, about sharing them with five people or something. Let's have them everywhere, everywhere. Let's have them. Did we get rid of all of them? Even with our broken machine, did every family get one at some point? Oh, c come on up, Remington. Let's look for a hand. Somebody who needs one. Oh, up there. Remington, you can go around. Any other hands? Oh, this is so wonderful. You're actually seeing missionary work as part of the church service. Our young people are working for Jesus. Well, what a privilege we have. What a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. And as we um, prepare for our final song, Where are the Reapers? I think you have a pretty good answer today. Where are they? Right here within the confines of our church. Hymn number 366, Oh, Where are the Reapers? Let's all stand. 300. 66, 366, and we're going to sing with great alacrity all three stanzas. We'll tell the story. <laughs> Oh, where are the reapers that garner in the shape of the good from the fields of sin? With sickness of truth must the work be done, and no one may rest till the harvest home. Where are the reapers oh, who will come and share in the glory of the harvest? home or oh, who will help us to garner in the sheaves of good fruit from the fields of sin second stanza the fields are a reaping wind far and wide the world now is warning the harvest tide but reapers are few and the work is great and much will be lost should the harvest wait. Where are the reapers? Oh, who will come and share in the glory of the harvest home? Oh, who will help us to garner in the sheaves of good food from the fields of sin? Last stanza. So come with your sickles, ye sons of men, and gather together the golden grain. Toil on till the Lord of the harvest come, then share ye his joy in the harvest home. 
Where are the reapers? Oh, will come and share in the glory of the harvest home. Oh, who will help us to gather in the sheaves of good from the fields of sin? Amen. Amen. You know why you're standing and every head is bowed? I'm going to ask James to play a little something that uh, we had. I don't think I'll play along, James, if you don't mind just playing. This is just a little praise testimony to God. And I'm going to ask uh, James to play it through two or three times. And I'm going to ask you to just bow your head while you're standing and ask, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Would you do that? Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the prayers that have gone up. In Jesus' name, amen. 